Today is Tuesday the 1st of February and thankfully we are done with what was a very volatile market uh, throughout January. Welcome to another PFS podcast. My name is Paul and today I'm going to be joined by Chief Investment Officer and Portfolio Manager for PM Capital, Paul Moore, as well as Kevin Bertoli, uh, Portfolio Manager for both Asian Equities and Australian Equities for PM Capital. Thank you, gents, for joining me. Great to be here. Good to be here. Thanks, Paul. So we'll set the scene uh, for those watching at home. <laughs> Uh, in 2021, the markets experienced another banner year. Uh, markets both in Australia and in America experienced gains of more than 20%. However, to start 2022, the markets have experienced quite a volatile and rocky ride. In America, the S&P 500 has dropped more than 5% uh, throughout the month of January, and the tech-heavy Nasdaq has dropped up nearly eight, uh, 9% throughout the month of January. As well as in Australia, we have seen a decline throughout January of up to 6%. While the market has many areas of concern, including the ongoing uh, constraint on the economy due to the Omicron variant, geopolitical tensions between Russia and Ukraine, the main focus for the market continues to be the Federal Reserve and its involvement in the market throughout 2022, with the possibility for up to or more than four rate hikes throughout the year, which has scared off market participants throughout the month of January. So Paul and Kevin, let's get started and get a discussion going regard, regarding the Federal Reserve and why the market has experienced this decline throughout the month of January. Yeah, well, I, I guess, as you said, markets have been very strong. So the reality is they don't go up in a straight line. Um, you know, valuations, we know, particularly in the sort of tech heavy so-called growth sectors of the market were very expensive. So you're, you're always going to get a correction of some sort. Um, and I guess, um, you know, we all knew that the Fed was eventually going to you know, increase rates and they should have done it a long time ago, to be honest. Um, and so they are in catch-up mode. And we've always highlighted you know, how there's this big um, dispersion between the so-called growth stocks valuation at record highs and the so-called value stocks at record lows. And we you know, fundamentally uh, and still you know, firmly believe that this is something that will take place over the normal 10-year cycle. We saw the you know, one big rotation after the Pfizer vaccine was announced because people became comfortable about the economy. Uh, but what was interesting is that you know, we always thought, well, what's going to be the catalyst to kind of get a correction going in these expensive parts of the market? And we always said it's going to be interest rates. Now, normally the market kind of anticipates, um, but what was interesting this time is that if you go back to say December, October, November, these sort of technology, um, you know, high growth, high revenue growth stocks were still selling at all time high valuations. But it's really interesting just before Christmas, what you saw despite record daily cases in Omicron, uh, interest rates started to go up. And we actually started to get some dramatic rotation between growth and value, you know, what we would call the second leg of that sort of you know, long-term trend. And so really, when you look back at January, it's been interesting because, because the week before Christmas and then heading into January, it was really just your typical rotation. Um, but what had it been hiding is that some of the really you know, crazy valuations, you know, the companies that earn no profits had been coming down. And then... As we got into January and interest rates kept moving up, um, the big cap tech stocks started coming down. Um, you know, the Apples, the Amazons, you know, et cetera. Um, but value was doing very well. And then when the Fed increased, you know, made their comments about increasing rates and people thought, well, hang on a minute, they're not only going to increase them, they're going to catch up a bit. So we're worried about liquidity, et cetera. Then the whole market had a bit of a correction. Um, but it's interesting, you sit here today and, you know, so you mentioned, you know, I think the S&P is down five, it was down seven or eight, you know, a couple of days ago. Uh, the Aussie dollar's come down, so it's kind of, you know, in Australian dollar terms, you know, I've subdued it a bit. But basically, as of yesterday, I mean, I think the market was down like three or four percent. Our actual fund was up um, six or seven percent because, you know, we've been heavily invested in what we think are the, you know, the real value longer term. And as I said, you know, for the economy, um, you know, people are thinking that Omicron is basically the beginning of the end in terms of COVID. Um, those stocks have been doing very well. So I think all that's happened is that you've gone from 
the realization that we're at extreme liquidity, extremely low rates. The Fed's now not only going to raise rates, they're going to catch up a bit. Because the other dynamic that's happened, you know, this change in sentiment, um, we've been talking about inflation for quite some time. But I reckon you go back a month or two and it was, oh, inflation's transitory. Well, what really happened coinciding with the Fed uh, was the fact that the sentiment changed to being transitory to, oh, no, it's going to be permanent and higher. And so we've gone from, you know, a year or two back, you know, low rates for longer to inflation's transitory to panic about inflation. Now, the reality is, you know, when you go through these situations, you just got to stay calm because just as you weren't going to get lower for longer rates because it was obvious you know, inflation was coming through, now you don't have to panic about inflation because it will subdue a bit as we head into the year, but it will base out at a lower level. So I think all that's happened is the market has been told very firmly that the Fed um, is a little bit worried that inflation might get ahead of themselves. They're going to catch up a bit. And so it's only natural that the most expensive parts of the market should see a significant correction. And to give you the magnitude of it, because you never see it in the indices, and when you look at individual stocks, you kind of think, how can the market not be down more? But if you look at those sort of TAM stocks, which, you know, whether it was a, an Uber Eats or uh, you know, these um, you know, Teslas or you know, other companies that you know, weren't making any money, I mean, they're down 90%, 80%, 70%. You'd be surprised. Um, and I think we've got a slide you know, that we'll put in the presentation, which highlights you know, just how significantly these stocks have come down. But even within NASDAQ, you know, the top 10 NASDAQ stops, they're down between 12 and 50%. So yeah, I think it was, it was, just, a, it was just a kind of a change in sentiment. And um, for us, it was confirmation that that value segment of the market is where you really want to be invested longer term. Yeah, I think one, one of the oh, interesting points to kind of add to that is, you know, I think inflation has really been that catalyst uh, and what has driven the inflection point in sentiment. But I think it's really important to remember, you know, we, we kind of all know how we got to where we are today, um, but the extreme nature of where markets were, you know, you've had this 40-year you know, interest rate cycle, which has played out. You've gotten to a point where you know, rates are sitting you know, at zero, uh, which has led to a change in behaviour for investors. You know, it's increased risk tolerances. You know, it's created those speculative manias that Paul's talked about in TAM stocks. You know, we've had a short position in a business like Carvana, you know, which is uh, directly you know, linked to that you know, part of the market. Um, but this le record low uh, interest rate environment has changed fundamentally how people think about valuation. Uh, what a business is worth, you know, how you discount cash flows and how you think about the present value of those future cash flows. So you have that on one hand. And then on the other hand, you add into the mix you know, this period, uh, the initial period of COVID, which really drove an acceleration of uh, earnings growth for some of those stocks that are considered to be you know, growth plays. Uh, and what that's done is it's created an environment where you know, the end result is the margin of error for that sector of the market uh, was very low. So if something was to go wrong or the status quo was to change, you could see you know, the type of sell-offs that we've seen in the last, the last month. Sorry to interrupt you before, Kevin. But yeah, I was going to add, um, I remember last year, it was, I don't know when we met with you, Paul, I met with you um, in May. And around that time, I also met a podcast around that time saying we've got to adjust portfolios to take into account that inflation may not be transitory as everyone says it's going to be. And I met with you back then and you were kind of slamming the table saying interest rates cannot last you. And um, we included you in our portfolio around that time as well. And uh, over the last month, we've definitely seen the outperformance of your fund um, as compared to many other funds, just because you've been prepared for a situation um, where the Fed's going to actually start to lift interest rates because they can't, they've got to put a finger on inflation. Um, but what I would also mention, I don't know if anyone's got a comment on this. Um, recently, I've seen liquidity in the market 
the market's fallen off a bit, um, but liquidity in the market continues to dry up. We're expecting an ending of quantitative easing by the Fed. Um, there's a few other factors that go into the market liquidity. Um, and I've got a graph that I'll put up here as well um, from CME Group. Um, liquidity in the market continues to dry up. If this liquidity can stays pretty low as, as, it is, as it is now compared to the last two years, do you expect that we're going to continue to see higher levels of volatility throughout the rest of 2022? Uh, by definition, if you have less liquidity, you're going to get higher levels of volatility. So effectively, all that liquidity that's been created by the central banks is effectively you know, pushing cash into the system um, and depresses interest rates because you know, they're buying every bond that they can get their hands on or they have been over the last couple of years. And remember, they're still buying. It's, it doesn't actually start turning off the tap for a couple of months. So... Yeah, whenever there's a change in demand or supply, you get a reaction. So effectively, they're going to stop buying bonds um, and liquidity starts slowly shrinking. And that's why interest rates have to go up. Uh, and that's why the market's constrained in terms of valuation. Um, and what we've highlighted consistently is what that means is those expensive parts of the market have now got a cap in valuation. And the reality is the risk that they get derated uh, whereas the cheaper parts of the market um, are not as sensitive to rates uh, because of their low valuations, but they're also beneficiaries of inflation and so they get the earnings growth. So effectively, that's exactly what you saw in January. You know, the volatility in January was to a large part rotation. Uh, you know, maybe the, towards the end of January, everyone got nervous and so the whole market kind of backed off and then it's kind of bounced a little bit towards the end. But... Yeah, you're definitely going to have, I would say, a more sideways at best market, but sectors in the market that all do well and sectors in the market that won't do well. Um, and um, yeah, you, you're going to get you know, bouts of volatility. I mean, markets have been very unusual the last two years. So people don't want to kind of think that that's the norm. That's the abnormal part of markets. Uh, we're heading back to a more normal environment is what I would suggest. And I'll lastly, I'll also comment, I'm having a look at uh, real interest rates, which is obviously interest rates after getting into inflation. And um, those real interest rates are beginning to tick up. And as those tick up, the required earnings yield on uh, the S&P, NASDAQ, you name it, is going to go up as well. And from that, you're going to see a lowering market if real interest rates continue to rise. However, we'll move on um, because... Being in business for such a long time, um, Paul and Kevin, you've both seen rising interest rate environments um, through 2004, uh, 2015-16, I'm pretty sure. What lessons have you taken from that and how have you seen the last month in the market and opportunities that you've seen? Uh, have you seen the last month as a buying opportunity? Um, do you still remain cautious? Yeah, it's interesting because you say we've we've seen rising interest rate environments, but they're all cyclical short-term rises in interest rates because what we've really seen is 40 years of lowering rates. And I think that's what investors really need to get their minds around because the long-term trend has changed. And that's really what's been playing out over the last 12 months. And January to me was just a confirmation of that. And so... Effectively, the behaviour of investors in, in the way that they behave with those short-term uh, move in rates, it's not necessarily going to be the same going forward because going forward, we've now got a rising long-term trend in interest rates. And that's why you want a very different subset of opportunities. Um, now, this is typical of markets. Right when you get an inflection in any trend is usually when you also get the extremes in over and under valuation. So you get the double whammy if you're able to move your portfolio around and you get the cheap part of the market just as its uh, fundamentals are turning. So the important thing for anyone invested in our fund and, and to me generally for investors is that they realise that 40-year trend in rates uh, has finished in terms of the downtrend. We're now going into an uptrend. So higher inflation, higher interest rates, 
And so the type of stocks that you want to own, very different, and it's going to play out over a long period of time. Now, the reason I raise that is if you look at January, for example, there's a lot of these TAM stocks or NASDAQ growth stocks that have you know, corrected. And short term, they probably corrected too much and they have a bit of a bounce. But we're not actually going to go, you know, we look, we do, we are filtering through in case some have come, you know, because some have come down 50%. But as a general rule, we don't want to be going and buying those companies because effectively it's the first correction they've experienced. They might bounce up, but they're on a long-term you know, derating period. So we actually want to stay disciplined in sticking with those real valuation anomalies that we discovered over the last two years and just let them play out over the next 10 years. Um, just like you know, if you go back to 2010, 11, 12, when we uh, bought into, say, Visa, and then over the next 10 years, it went from 12 times to 30 times and we've sold out. Uh, the cycle before that, we bought into the brewers at single digit pairs and let them play out over the next 10 years to 20 pairs. So it's really important um, that people stick to their long-term framework because, um, yeah, I think what you've really just seen is the first signs uh, of the derating of the high growth sectors. Um, and if anything, you know, on the corrections, you just want to keep using that as an opportunity, depending on how you position to buy into those value sectors longer term. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'd say one thing, you know, Paul, you mentioned that you know, over the last you know, 10 years, we've seen some cycles you know, in interest rates. The reality is most people that are in markets today only know one direction in interest rates. So what that means is it takes time for that dynamic to change, the way people behave. Uh, it takes time for that dynamic to, to eventually shift. So you know, as Paul said, you, you're kind of at the start of that process. And it's interesting when you have these sharp you know, moves you know, down, a lot of that's driven by you know, the, the sentiment that's in market, the, you know, the short-term you know, nature of a lot of investors that are in markets. We've seen a huge growth in retail investors in the last you know, one to two years. They tend to be you know, people that are younger. So this leg that we've had, you know, is, is probably the first leg. And it's, it's interesting because we have this tendency when you see these sharp corrections, you know, a company might be off 30 or 40%. Uh, and the default view for people is to say, well, surely if it's 30 or 40% off its highs, you know, that represents an opportunity. You know, investors tend to uh, anchor themselves to the high point and that valuation at the high point. And when you look at a valuation that might be 30% below the high point, you know, it starts to spark interest in people's you know, mind because they have that as the, the benchmark. Our view, and correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but our view would be that the irrational part in markets was the high point. What you've seen over the last you know, 10 years and, and even longer is this re-rating of valuation over time. Uh, you look at a business like Apple, you know, trading low teens 10 years ago. You look at the business now trading in excess of 20 times. So that takes a long time to shift. You know, people talk about five-year average valuations and stuff like that, but there's a long revision and you're probably just at the start of that. You, know, you see uh, earnings adjustments will have to start to come through too because obviously we've been in a period where you know, COVID accelerated those growth rates. You see business like you know, PayPal or Netflix, you know, they're two of the stocks that have come off you know, in the last three months. PayPal's off 45% from its high, Netflix is off 40%. But that was one evaluation story, but also you know, anticipations of earnings growth being you know, adjusted downwards. So those are the things that take time to play out in the market. So as Paul said, you know, we'll look at areas and obviously you have big moves in markets, it throws up opportunity, but you know, that interest rate story, you know, that inflation story, you know, we don't think are ones that fade overnight. <clears throat> and I think if you think about that inflation picture that Paul talked about, uh, and the dramatic shift we've seen in the short term around people's uh, you know, belief that it may be more structural in nature than, than transitory. Of course, there's elements in, in inflation today you know, which are transitory. You know, we know COVID has had some impact, but if you look at our portfolios and you know, where we've been invested, there's definitely elements of structural inflation uh, at play today. You know, you look at the US and the, the labor market, you know, that's, that's one area of uh, you know, structural inflation. 
you look at the energy transition, and this has been something that's central to our portfolios, you know, that is a very hard transition to make without causing an inflationary environment. So if you think about those factors, uh, labour, uh, energy, you know, they're the two biggest components that go into the you know, input for any good. Uh, so that's what's driving our view on longer term inflation. Um, and obviously that view on interest rates and, and that plays through to the behaviour of you know, how people invest and, and that longer term nature of that transition. Awesome. Um, so in terms of just your current portfolio uh, positioning, so you do have quite a heavy value tilt at the moment with um, exposure to sectors such as materials, financials, energy. Um, do you want to go over just how the past couple months has increased your conviction in a sector such as energy or financials, both powerful on a global space and Kevin on the Australian equity space, just uh, touch on, have you increased, have you seen increased conviction uh, in like energy, oil prices? Um, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll focus on energy in the banks. So um, if you look, I mean, the, the cheapest sector in the market is European banks. Um, and that's our, you know, no surprise, our biggest position. And the issue for the European banks is they've been the worst hit by lower interest rates. So now that the interest rate sentiment's changed, you know, they've, 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 they've rallied. Um, but the interesting thing is they're still on probably eight times earnings uh, when you adjust for their excess capital. And so the issue, you know, with the European banks is, uh, are they ever going to raise interest rates in Europe? <laughs> um, and are they ever going to give us their money back? Well, a couple of things have happened. The most interesting thing to me is the German bonds are the ones that have been in big negative territory for quite some time. They're back at zero. That's been the big change over the last, you know, couple of months. So even in Europe, we're starting to see the sentiment change on interest rates. Very positive because European banks are probably the most interest sensitive banking sector in, in, the, in the globe. Secondly, as they're announcing their results, we're not only getting confirmation of dividends, but they're all starting to out announce buybacks. And the beauty of buybacks is they're all selling at a discount per book. So it's really favorable to shareholders. So my conviction in European banks has always been strong, but we've now got confirmation that it's coming through. Um, so it, it, yeah, it adds to that conviction you want to maintain a core position for a long period of time. We could be really at the start of a long-term period of outperformance for European banks. Then if you look at um, energy, energy is really interesting. Or well, specifically, if you look at commodities, here's an interesting thing. US dollar has been very strong and yet commodities are still at their high. Normally when the US dollar is strong, commodities correct. So I'm still trying to work out you know, what it's telling us and, and whatever, but um, you know, it highlights just how strong the underlying demand for commodities is. And, and the market's worried that they're ahead of themselves and they're going to pull back. But one commodity until recently that was way out of whack with the other commodities was oil. Uh, it was very cheap relative to the other commodities because people are worried about you know, electric cars, et cetera, et cetera. But what you've been seeing is that because boards of directors have been scared into not investing into you know, these sort of commodity areas. Capital expenditure in oil has been very, very constrained. And what that means is eventually um, non-OPEC production is declining. OPEC increases their share of markets. The oligopoly comes back and you've seen oil prices go 50, 60, 70. Last night, you know, they're in the 80s. And yet, if you looked at a chart of Royal Dutch Shell, um, Woodside Petroleum in Australia, and Seanook in China, and you put them in US dollars, so they're comparable to the US counterparts, US guys are back near their highs. Those three that I mentioned are 50% below um, their highs. And so... What we're seeing is, you know, as the results come out, is continued discipline on capital expenditure, return of cash flow, which gives us even further conviction in those three oil companies that we own, not only because of the industry trends, but because they're selling at a significant discount to their, you know, their peers in the US. 
So yeah, both over the last three months, both those areas uh, has been a tick in terms of you know, our thought process that the thesis is playing out. Um, but yeah, we've always, every one of those investments we bought for the next 10 years. So basically what we do is we sit there and make sure that the story is coming through. Uh, and to date it is, yeah. Now, the only risk to the equation for the market uh, overall, or the most significant risk, is if the Fed does get too aggressive on rates and they crunch liquidity um, and you will get a, a, a correction in the market. But if that was to occur, uh, I'm sure they'd back off pretty quickly. And again, you want to be buying into the same sectors of the market because that's where the long-term valuation is. Yeah. Kevin, you've got anything to add to that? You know, I think if you look at our, our funds and one of the hallmarks of PM Capital is you know, when we're identifying these opportunities to invest, we're investing across all of our funds. So if you think about you know, our global, Paul mentioned, you know, Woodside, Royal Dutch, you know, Seanook as stocks we've you know, bought in the energy complex. You know, we own energy stocks here in Australia as well. So we've got Woodside as well. We've got you know, Beach Petroleum. So a lot of the positioning is the same. You know, one of the things I, I would highlight would be you know, a lot of the time there's this talk of you know, value versus growth and it's uh, very broad terminology, but it's important for you know, your clients to understand that those definitions are very porous. You know, at the end of the day, it's a function of the business's ability to grow its earnings and cash flow and how it compares to the market's expectations. So if you look at you know, copper in 2008, where we were um, you know, heavily uh, you know, doing a lot of research in that sector, you know, It looks like his internet's frozen. <laughs> That's uh, frozen up. Maybe they need to spend a bit more money on those copper lines. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, we'll get him to, when he joins back up, we'll get him to uh, get back in. But, but, but bottom line is, yeah, everything we're seeing is just, you know, further increasing our conviction that this, you know, rotation between sectors in the market will play out over a long period of time. And that's the important thing for him investors to understand because I suspect there's still you know what happens when you get these long-term trends it just keeps corralling everyone into the same sectors and so I think most people are still way over represented in the expensive parts of the market and so yeah when they get a, a bit of a correction they might think oh well it's happened and we're okay again but to be honest if they rally I'd be using that as an opportunity to keep rotating into the better you know longer term sectors of the market. Sorry guys I dropped out there. Yep, we'll get you to just pick up where you uh, left off in regards oh, to where, do, where did I, uh, where did you lose me? Uh, You're talking about copper, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and obviously in, in the Australian fund and our global fund, what we've been able to do over time is you know rotate. Obviously, copper was one of the first sectors that you know moved amongst the commodity landscape. You know, it had ties to renewable energies, to EV, so it was seen as more attractive. But it's been the ability to, you know, in the names we hold for production to come through, uh, for, you know, commodity prices to, to rise. So we've rotated some of that capital into, you know, the energy space. You know, we still have big positions in, you know, the Australian banks. So but the important part to kind of highlight is, you know, what we're really focused on is at the stock or sector level, the ability for those businesses to, execute on you know earnings growth that will surprise the market and that's essentially what gets people to you know relook at these sectors because we know that you know the last decade was you know the toughest for value um, and if you look at the flip side you know it's been the most successful for, for momentum so that that rotation is one that's definitely in our view uh, in the very early stages. Thanks, Kevin. So I'll just finish off and just saying this is like this time when the markets are experiencing this level of volatility, this is when it's good to have active managers in your portfolio. And um, obviously PFS, we have uh, PM Capital uh, and we've been glad that we introduced PM Capital into our portfolio last year and um, they provided alpha um, for our clients and our clients watching. Um, during volatile times and it's great to have to ensure that when the market's uh, being noisy that um, you continue to have active managers to ensure that 
we're continuing continuing to move in the right direction. Um, but after all, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Kevin, for joining me. Um, thanks for this session, just talking about the recent volatility in the markets and um, how you both are thinking of it, both in a global stance and uh, from an Australian perspective for uh, global equities, Australian equities, and um, I'm sure our clients will enjoy this discussion. All right, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.